Yeah, bowling off this Friday edition of the Sportsbank Zone with cricket. The Caribbean Premier League, dubbed the biggest party in sport, is headed for the playoffs with only one place up for grabs. After inclement weather stunted the early games in the competition, the action has been fierce since with memory what has grown to be a must-see event across the Caribbean and indeed the world. The man with responsibilities for running this tournament, CPL CEO Pete Russell, joins us via Zoom. Uh, Pete Russell, it's a pleasure to have you on the Sportsmax Zone. First of all, how are you doing? Yeah, good. I'm enjoying a day off, actually. So, uh, yeah, nice to be with you. Just give us an overview of how things have gone in 2023 as far as the Republic Bank CPL is concerned and the massive women CPL. Yeah, I think it's been uh, enormously successful up to now. It's, uh, it obviously started off uh, a little shakily with the weather in St Lucia, um, but as soon as we got to St Kitts, obviously everything dried up. And the cricket, I think, has been exceptionally competitive. All teams can you know, on their day beat each other uh, and as I think you alluded to the women um, tournament I think was a great success as well so yeah really happy with the way things have gone uh, operationally of course it's always a challenge if things don't go your way but um, you know the team have have come through all of that and I think we're we're set for a great final week here in Guyana. Yeah for sure since the massive women CPL um, has concluded let me start by um, getting there, Stefani Taylor at the end of the tournament, um, the former West Indies captain suggesting that maybe we should look at having more teams in the women's CPL, at least one more team. How did that sentiment reach you? Yeah, look, I think we, we've always said we would, we would grow the tournament over time, which means we'll add more teams to it. Uh, I think we have to be careful that we do that uh, in a way that allows you know, all teams to be competitive. Um, and it's something we're discussing with, with CWI actually as we speak because you know for us it's natural to try and go to four teams from 2024 um, but we've got to make sure that obviously the, the teams are well balanced and there's the, the talent pool um, to complement four teams so um, you know our, our ideal is obviously to match the men and get to six teams for the women in, in, in the shortest possible time but um, we'll just have to see how that goes. Yeah, how difficult would it be for your organization to move from, let's say, three to four teams within a year um, if, if, if you were to become serious about making this happen for the next staging of the women's CPL? So it's not really, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot more operationally um, to, to add another team. Um, you know, obviously the structure's there to cope with, with it. Um, I think it, it is more about you know, does it make sense in terms of the balance of the tournament to make sure that there's enough, obviously, young West Indian players uh, who are, are, are at that level that they'll be able to compete um, with the, the players we already have? So, so that's really, I think, the consideration. Um, you know, we, we're certainly very prepared to have another team. It, it is just about, you know, to make sure everyone's ready to, to accept that. So uh, operationally, it doesn't make a, a huge amount of difference. Um, so, you know, hopefully the fourth team will be added sooner rather than later. Right, and Pete, personally, I welcomed the addition of the international players. I think it made a massive difference in the quality of the women's CPL, so much so that I saw a lot of fans coming out in their numbers for the earlier matches and then staying on for the men's matches. What did you think about the addition of the international players? Because when we're planning, everything sounds nice, but when it's executed, then of course we have to do a post analysis and come up with whether it worked or not. Yeah, look, I, th I think the international players made a huge difference, as you say. Uh, and, you know, just speaking to the international players and also obviously the local players, it, it's pretty clear that the international players love being here uh, and they also love sh sharing their knowledge. So, uh, and I think that was very well received by the local players, which is, is really what um, the whole process is about. It's about improving West Indian cricketers to make sure they go on and play well for West Indies. So on, on that level, I think it worked brilliantly. I think your point about you know, the fact that the fans came out early, I think we did do a good thing by linking the tickets, i.e. The, having a double head of the men and the women. I think that worked very well, uh, especially obviously in Trinidad, uh, where fans did come for the, for the latter part of the women's game. And, 
you know, one of the discussions we're having at the minute is whether actually we put on uh, a women's game on its own for a seven o'clock slot um, next year because we believe actually that the fans will come out and watch them um, without having the support of the men's game. So, you know, the, the women's game has, has really moved on very quickly, which is, is very pleasing for all of us. Yeah, I like that a lot. I love that idea of the 7 p.m. slot. Uh, we're talking about crowd support. Which country, based on your numbers, and you've been traveling uh, country to country looking on at the matches, which country would you say, based on what you've seen, has the biggest support so far? Uh, you're obviously wearing a shirt that points me in one particular direction. <laughs> no, um, don't, don't, don't be um, swayed by the shirt. Uh, I mean, Barbados, I think, the Sunday night in Barbados when um, Cornwall got his 100, I don't think I've felt or heard a noise like it in the stadium. It was, it was quite electric. Um, Trinidad just delivers every time. I mean, the, the, the fan support there is, is fantastic. And again, you know, having those two wonderful stadiums is, is, a, is a great contrast. Um, and here in Guyana, I mean, you know, the, as soon as you arrive in the airport here, you just get that cricket fever and it's... Uh, uh, it, it never fails to, to disappoint here. So, you know, we're going to have a great weekend. I mean, there's a massive game, as you know, tomorrow night. Um, you know, again, first place against second. It, there's not much on the line, but actually there's a lot on the line to see who comes out on top there. And, you know, we've still got everything to play for in terms of the third and fourth place. So uh, the crowds here will, will be great. And um, as I said, I think we're in for a great finale. Really looking forward to that. Pete, you were appointed CPL CEO in 2021. What has been your personal, your biggest achievement so far? Well, it's, I think it's the women. I mean, you know, I think that was something that, you know, I really felt was missing. Um, you know, it was, uh, we got criticised a, a lot um, for obviously not doing something with the women earlier. Um, and I was determined to, to bring it in. I think it was... Uh, you know, you, you you never quite know how these things go, but not only have the fans embraced it, but commercially all the franchises have embraced it, uh, and, and the players have been exceptional. I, I think the quality of the women's cricket from, to, from from last year to this year has been immense, which, uh, again, is just testament to the effort and the work the players have put in, uh, but also their dedication to make sure that, you know, this franchise league is successful, which is really heartening to see. Yeah, Pete, the narrative coming from your organizing committee has been one of pride and satisfaction about the success of the CPL for the years. Could you, could you speak specifically to its growth? Because we know that it has a global market, it is a global product. Can you say definitively that it has grown and uh, maybe tangibly explain in probably some numbers um, the growth of the CPL over the years? Yeah, look, it's, you know, the, it's undisputed that as of last year, it was the second most watched league in the world, which is a phenomenal achievement when you think about, you know, where the games are played, because, you know, the majority of our games are played when the rest of the world is asleep. So um, it, it is extraordinary. But, you know, the, the way that people watch now in terms of the games, there's a lot of digital catch up. It's not all about the live action. Um, you know, we, we were very proud of those numbers. And, um, actually, COVID, in a funny sort of way, did us a favour because obviously people were at home and were able to experience CPL for the first time. And again, I think people just don't understand how good West Indies cricket is. And you know, the, I was talking to some uh, some of the international players today, and they said it's amazing how hard the West Indies boys hit the ball, um, how hard they um, they bowl, and you know the effort that they put in. And it's it's, it's, it's heartening to hear that again. It doesn't necessarily reflect in what West Indies is doing, but I don't think it will be too long before you see them being successful in that arena as well. Uh, great to hear you say that, Pete. A lot of uh, West Indies fans and viewers uh, watching will be very encouraged by those words. We have a lot more to talk about, and we'll be back after the break. The game is getting hotter. Take it now or never. Hit another six. There's no way we can lose. This is who we are. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Wave your hand, wave your hand, wave your hand, come and say carry on. Wave your hand, wave your hand, wave your hand, come here one number one. Come here ready for the competition. Yeah. You don't make intimidation. Yeah. Wait, wait, woman or man. Yeah, we are talking with uh, Pete Russell. He is CEO of the CPL, the Caribbean Pr Premier League, sponsored by Republic Bank, and um, getting ready for the playoffs. Uh, just a couple of matches remaining now. Pete, um, you were talking when we went to break about the value and the excitement of West Indies cricket, even though it's not commensurate with the current world ranking of the West Indies team in T20 internationals. But uh, can you talk briefly as well about the uniqueness of uh, T20 cricket in the Caribbean as far as fan interaction is concerned and so on, because I believe that that is part of the beauty of the CPL. Yeah, and, and I think, it, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's really what we want to portray. Uh, and actually, I, I talk a lot with Danny Morrison about it on commentary is to say, look, you know, it is unique. It's an extraordinary atmosphere that you get. To, and, and it's different in every single country. So we want to make sure that people understand that. So when they're sitting in the city rooms at home, whether it's in the Caribbean or around the world, uh, they get that feeling that uh, I want to go and watch that. I want to be there because that is an experience that will be unforgettable. And, uh, and let me tell you, it is unforgettable. I mean, you know, I've been doing this now for 11 years and it, it is still spine tingling to go and watch some of these games. And as I said, that Sunday in Barbados in particular, when Rakim was going bonkers, um, it was an exceptional uh, experience. And you know, I'm sure again, you know, if Guyana get to the final, uh, on, on next Sunday, then I think we'll have a similar experience. It will be the roof will come off problems. Yeah, Pete, as I said, the West End is currently ranked seven in the world in T20 cricket, and you just expressed the view that it would be great to see the West Indies rising again as far as um, the top flight of T20 cricket globally is concerned. I know you're not a coach or, or, or a technical cricket person, but what... From your standpoint, do you think it would take for the West Indies to get back into the top two, top three in the world? Well, I, th I think you've got the right man leading the charge there. So, you know, Darren Sammy is, is a phenomenal operator. He, you know, he's a man motivator and he's, I think, exceptionally talented from a tactics point of view. So he's pretty new to the job. So I think he obviously needs a bit of time. But then again, invest in the youth. I mean, there's some extraordinary young talent that's coming through. And again, we're seeing it in CPR this year. So... It's just making sure that, you know, that they're all channeled in the right way. They get the opportunities to play uh, in tournaments like this, because I think that, again, similar to the women, it gives them exposure um, to some of the international players they're playing against. So that fear factor goes a bit. Um, but, yeah, just, just back them, because, as I said, uh, there's absolutely no, no issue with the talent and the quality here. Uh, and I think you'll find post or, or during and post the World Cup, you know, facilities will improve for the players. Uh, and, um, and that's only going to be a good thing. Yeah, Pete, we spoke about the possible expansion of the women's CPL. Um, what about the expansion of the men's CPL? Is there interest from any other territory outside of the six that we currently have um, becoming additions to the, to, to, to the men's CPL tournament? Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, we... You know, not a day goes by without me getting a call from someone that wants to own a team in CPL because, um, you know, they, they, they see what it's like. They, they see the crowds and fervour and the, they see the support that a franchise gets here. So there's no, no lack of support. But again, you know, I'm a little bit of the mindset, if, if it ain't broke, why fix it? <clears throat> so, you know, adding another team or two new teams, again, changes the dynamic. Uh, and, and is that a step too far? <clears throat> To be honest, I don't know. You won't know until you try it. But for now, we're very happy with the structure and the length of the tournament. I think that's the other thing you've got to remember. My view is that a lot of the other tournaments just go on for too long. And, you know, you've got to keep people at the end of the tournament wanting a little bit more. And I think CPL does that at the minute. Yeah. Can you say where some of this interest is coming from? I, I know, for example, that a lot of money is being spent at Arnas Vale in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, hoping to get more international matches. And um, when I saw it, I just wondered to myself, I wonder if CPL is a part of this grand plan. Oh, look, it's, it would be unfair of me to say exactly where it comes from. But, yeah, look, it's, it's, that there's a, probably three or four now uh, Caribbean countries that would want to, to look at hosting CPL. Um, and I think we do a very good job at hosting CPL. Again, I just think it's, 
you know, there's probably a, a timing issue there. Now, do I think at some point we will go to eight teams? 100% we'll get there. Um, but I'm not sure it's in the near term. I think one of the, the, the disappointments, um, certainly from a Jamaican standpoint, is the fact that the CPL has not been to the land of wood and water since 2019. From your standpoint as CEO, how disappointed are you with that development? Look, I, that's my, you know, it, we talk about what, what are your successes in the job. That is my biggest failure in the job, that we're not playing cricket in Jamaica. Um, it's, it's a great sadness to me because... You know, it's it's. You just have to look around the league. We have some of the most talented players on show come from Jamaica, uh, and also when we played in Jamaica, of course, the fans were exceptional. So, you know, I'd love to be playing games back there. But you know, we have a a, a model that works for us. Um, you know, we're very open about that model, and we've had very good and I think very instructive discussions with the government in Jamaica. Um, and at the minute, it's not for them, and that's. That's fine. I mean, you know, the governments only have so much money to spend on sport and, and other recreational activities. And if cricket stroke CPL is not one of those, then we have to respect that. Although, of course, that is hugely disappointing for us and the franchise. But, uh, yeah, that's something that I'd love to put right. And, and hopefully we will, we will put right. Pete, one of the views coming from the support for the government's position of not supporting the Jamaica Talawas for home games at Sabina Park, or even the Trelawney Stadium for that matter, is the view that the owners of the Jamaica Talawas are businessmen. Um, we had them live on our show last week or the week before discussing some of their discussions with the government. And there was a view that these are businessmen who are trying to make money and the government is not obligated to get into any contractual arrangements with them, um, offering them financial support for a project for the Talawas playing cricket in Jamaica. Um, could you comment on that and, and the fact that it is the same in other countries and other, other governments have supported their local franchises? Yeah, I'm not sure that them being businessmen is necessary. I think that's a bit of a red herring. I think what they're trying to do um, is, and look, Chris Passati, who's obviously the owner, has committed a huge amount of funds over the years, um, more than any other franchise, without a shadow of doubt. So he's really looked to invest, uh, and that was always his ambition. And as you know, he owns a stadium in Miami as well. So it's not just about uh, a business transaction for him. He, he really did want to grow the franchise in Jamaica. I think the other element of it is, and you know, one of the proposals that we put forward to the government was, look, Let's look at this as a public-private partnership. You know, how can we help from uh, a, a private perspective to encourage private organisations, corporations to work alongside the government to come up with the funds required to make sure that we can bring games back to Jamaica? And you know, there was a very full and frank discussion about that. And you know, I sent a model as to how that could look and work. So, you know, we're trying our bit to make sure that the government is. Totally is, is not totally on the hook, uh, as it shouldn't be. Uh, you know, there has to be a lot of support, obviously, from from the private sector as well. So, you know, hopefully, um, and as I said, we've explained the model very clearly to the government that that it isn't just about them putting money in and and not receiving anything back, because of course, hosting games does come with a huge amount of return because the investment that we put in, effectively, whatever the government gives, we spend back. Uh, and more besides. So um, it's certainly not a one-way street and, and, and that's really the way the model works and that's why you see other governments around the region put money in because they know they get a return on their investment. Yeah, and Pete, you're confirming then that the onus on having uh, Talawas play cricket in Jamaica is not solely on the owners of the Talawas. The CPL uh, hierarchy, of which you are a part, would be a part of those discussions. Yeah, 100%, because, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this together. It's, uh, it's, CPL is a, is a family, and, you know, for me, as I said, my biggest failure is, is not having games in Jamaica. Um, you know, it's been, it's been something that, you know, since the minute we, we didn't play there, has been a great regret. So, you know, I'm hoping that we're, we're going to be able to turn a corner soon, um, but it does mean all partners and parties have to come together and come up with a, a solution that works for everyone. Uh, I, th I think there is that solution, um, but uh, let's see how we get on for 2024.
Yeah, and Pete, one of the things that I like about the CPL is when I'm there, there are so many different brands available. There are so many people giving out things, ensuring that the fans feel very involved. So something like the one handball catch, you know, of course, those attending the matches can win a lot of money. I was reading an article today and it's up to 5,000 US dollars now if you're in the mound and you catch that ball with one hand. I said all that to ask you, how has it been attracting sponsorship? Because from the outside looking on, we see a lot of sponsors. Has it been as easy as it looks? Oh, and that's the beauty of it. it. It probably looks too easy, but it's no, it's been incredibly difficult. And you know, that's why you have to build a brand um, that is aspirational, obviously, for fans. And uh, as we mentioned before, fans around the world, but also for commercial partners. They want to, they obviously want to be part of something which is going to rub off well on their brand and I think CPL does give them that it's uh, you know it's well thought of around the region and I'm delighted I've got a team that run it incredibly well so uh, it is always well run uh, and and sponsors feel safe in that environment that they can put their money in know they're going to get again a return on on the money that they put in but they've been fantastic and you know as you say we were able to run on these great initiatives the 10 a.m. games where we have all the kids coming in and uh, you know, all the face painting, the, the free popcorn, you know, the free party atmosphere that we give those young kids has been, a, again, a huge success this year where kids are watching cricket for the first time, both boys and girls. And, you know, that to me is another great success of CPL. But, um, yeah, look, the mound is going to be mad next week where we've got $5,000 for that one single-handed catch. Mm. I, I might need to close the mound and just have myself standing on there, actually. So. Oh, you could put me. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to use my second phone and answer the question that we asked earlier <laughs> and see if I can win the, the, the tickets um, for the match on Sunday. Um, Pete, it's the end of the 19th over and we have not bowled all our questions in time and I see a red card coming out from our producers. I wonder from your standpoint though because well I don't like the fact that my producer is going to be giving me a red card and I gather some of the captains don't like the fact that the umpires are giving them red cards. Uh, given everything that has happened in this inaugural well, season of utilizing the red card um, for slow over rates, would you any at all be open um, to removing the, the red card rule? No. Um, you know, for, for me, it, it was there for a reason, which is to, to speed up the game. We've now got games being played 20 minutes faster than they were last year. So it, it's done its job. And, you know, you have to look across the 26 games. Um, we've had three red cards. Now, they've been over by about a minute, minute and a half. So it's been pretty close. But, you know, most captains, in fact, all captains, apart from um, one notable one, have accepted it as being good for the game. It speeds them up a little bit. You know, and even last night, you know, there was a, they were uh, a minute down in the 17th. They were a bit caught up. Um, so captains are beginning to learn to, to, to work with it. What we have done for the, for the playoffs is we've extended it by five minutes, giving them five minutes extra because we understand, you know, that the pressure of a playoff or, or a final will be uh, a little bit more. So, so they get a bit more leeway in the playoffs and the final. But I think as a as a project and uh, as a new initiative, it's done exactly what we wanted it to do. Yeah, Pete Russell, let's leave that there for today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and uh, continue to do an amazing job. The product looks magnificent. Wherever you watch it across the world, it looks even better on the home of champions, by the way. But yeah, it's Sportsmax um, and it's been wonderful. And for me, it's been especially wonderful watching the matches in Guyana. I know you spoke about Barbados and on the night that Rakeem Cornwall scored that amazing century. Um, but it just looks as if there isn't even space to walk when the matches are being played at Providence. And I can't wait to see what the playoffs look like. Thank you very much for joining us and all the very best with the rest of the season. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And I love your new studio as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. We love it as well. Um, <laughs> no one more than Mariah Ramarak. But I've never seen Mariah Ramarak so excited to leave the studio um, from we were doing rehearsals because she wants to get to Guyana for the CPL playoffs. Hey, I have never been to Guyana and I have 
spoken to our team here and I said, you know, I'm really interested in going into Guyana because I look at it on the TV and as you said, Ricardo, I think I'd fit in perfectly there and it's a vibe and I'm going anywhere that there's a vibe. Mariah, you would fit in anywhere there is a vibe, like the party last night. Let's take a break on the sports magazine. <laughs> Woman, I'm on. We have a little honor. This is how we play.